Hey everyone, welcome back to the Flow Track Podcast. I'm Kevin Sully, joined by Lincoln Shrike, special guest on the show today. Pleased to welcome Mary Kane. Mary, thank you so much for hopping on. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Well, we appreciate your time. It is a, a busy week, I assume, for you with this new opportunity that comes up with with Tracksmith. Let's let's start there. Um, how did the job come about? What what are you going to be doing? Yeah, so initially I had um, started a conversation with Matt and the team at Tracksmith uh, over like a marketing opportunity that was initially intended to just be like a one-time thing. And the more I got to know the team and the more I got to talking to everybody, I realized that the company was a really great fit for me just in terms of um, what they're trying to do, their um, almost like views on the sport as a whole, like things that the sport's doing well and areas that we all kind of see growth in. Um, and then just like kind of naturally the conversation developed and Matt Taylor had mentioned to me, he was the founder of Tracksmith at the time, that they were sort of in similar talks with another athletes at the same moment. And now I know that to be Nick Willis, but at the time I had no idea who that was. <laughs> um, and so I feel like there was almost like me on one end and Nick on the other, like having very similar conversations with the team at Tracksmith. And for them, it just, you know, I think kind of clicked where we all came to the same understanding at the same time that having a more involved relationship with a company um, and in this case being an actual employee would be a really great way for us to be more involved um, and for us to be able to like do the activations that we were really kind of hoping to that could help change the sport but also have a sponsor really supporting us uh, to do those things so for both nick and i we're a part of the like community team um and my specific role is the new york city community manager i live in the city um that's where i have lived for the past year and a half. That's where I do all my training. Um, and so it was just like a natural extension for Tracksmith, who is currently based in Boston um, and who has just created this amazing running scene within the Boston community um, to take the next step and try to develop a similar community within the New York scene. And uh, it'll be my main role to help lead that. But in truth, um, my role is also much larger because we're only a 23 person team. So I'll also be focusing on um, helping with, you know, product development um, in terms of like testing things and giving our product team input and bigger activations. So even though my like main role is um, still growing and, you know, we're going to kind of hopefully be releasing more specific stuff within the next couple months, um, you know, there's, there's kind of a lot of little jobs along there as well. It's interesting to me always because professional athletes, they usually start so young and some of them get into their 30s and they've never had a quote unquote real job before. Is this your first real job or did you have a summer job in, in high school growing up? Uh, so I did babysit <laughs> before I had gone <laughs> pro. Um, so that was really the only job experience. That, and I refereed like a couple times. That was kind of traumatic. I didn't, I didn't really stick with refereeing for soccer. Um, but since my um, pro career started, I've also uh, worked at a running studio in New York City called Mile High, which I'm still a uh, part of. And I, you know, teach about like three or four uh, classes a week. And it's super fun because that was my first uh, really like employee relationship um, where you have to do onboarding and like sign paperwork and the whole thing. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> this past February, I also... Um, started a part-time job with New York Roadrunners, and I'm like a regular part-time employee with them. So I actually have two um, or three jobs kind of outside of my running career, mm. but all are super supportive of my running, and um, they understand that my schedule is a little bit more flexible. When you think of a job that has the word community in, in it, you naturally think of being around a lot of people but of course we're in this COVID-19 pandemic and I know you've only started your job uh in the last couple of weeks but what restraints or constraints have been put on your role given the current global situation that we're in yeah so in the uh you know Boston community uh there's already been 
group runs that have been going on um, for the past few years. And of course, they had to come to a halt because we can't, you know, have large gatherings during this time. And in many ways, a lot of the work that I hope to be doing in the New York City community is similar. So hosting group runs, um, you know, group workouts, or even just group in-person talks and events like that, I can't do right now. Um, but I, I try to look at the positive and that it's going to give me some time to hopefully really, um, you know, have time to make all the kind of behind the scenes work to have those activations possible in the future. And um, in the meantime, we're hoping to start um, unveiling in the New York City community ways that we can all um, be connected, but not necessarily be doing it in person while we still have to respect social distancing rules. Um, and so it's just about kind of challenging uh, the norm, I guess, and trying to be creative. And I started officially with TrackSmith uh, a month ago on April 20th. So I've had some time to be kind of building up um, plans from before we announced publicly. So hopefully we'll be, you know, launching a few things pretty soon. The uh, part of the marketing campaign, a big marketing portion of it was the going amateur, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, tagline or phrase. What was the process of deciding as a team to kind of make that, a, I don't want to say a mantra, but to, to make that part of what you, the announcement you were making to the public about your signing? Yeah, that was really cool. I loved that. I think the, uh, you know, like nerd in me who really liked taking Latin classes in middle school and high school, um, loved kind of looking into the history of what it almost really means to be amateur. And I think it's a, a term that's almost had a negative connotation in the past within at least um, elite sports, because it's this way to differentiate, I think, for people how fast you can almost be. It's like a professional is faster than an amateur. Um, and so for me, I, I really appreciated the fact that um, the origins of the word come from, uh, you know, the Latin for, for the love of. Um, and so the idea with Tracksmith is how could we almost link Nick and I, who have run on the professional um, and elite levels, to people who are maybe sub-elite or who have full-time jobs and are, are trying to be their best. Um, and this campaign is really meant to show that you can balance um, your relationships, your jobs, you know, all these different facets of your life with being the best athlete you can be. And just because you have balance in your life doesn't mean you can't run at elite levels because at the end of the day, we're all doing it for the love of the sport. We're all um, doing it because we want to. And it's kind of showing other people um, who are trying to find balance in their life that you can do it on, you know, all levels so i i loved the campaign and the shirt's really comfortable so it was fun to run in <laughs> in the new york times op-ed a year ago or so i'm losing track of time in the pandemic it was sometime yeah, in 2019 six months yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it really only six months yeah well what's that yeah. can you just can you describe what that's that's been like going from that telling your whole story um, there's been obviously some back and forth, some responses, and you've responded to where you are now. Yeah, I think it's been uh, like a really cathartic experience for me. I think that's the word that I often use. Um, in that before I had really told my story publicly, I always felt there was this kind of like weight on me and just this like thought in the back of my head that I was um, like holding on to something. And by finally being able to kind of accept everything that had happened, acknowledge it for myself, come to terms with it my for myself, and then share it in such a way uh, with the hopes that it could maybe help some other people and kind of free them from the weights that they had been carrying um, was just not only very empowering for myself, but I hope empowered a lot of other people. Um, and since then, it's been quite the whirlwind just because I was able to, and I, I partly credit the fact that I was able to tell my story for why I was able to have um, the longest stint of healthy running kind of between now and then um, and have my first full season of running under me. Um, at this point, I've been running healthy for maybe like 
seven, eight months or something. And it's not that there's not like little blips in the road, but there's been um, just like a steady, like accumulation of miles, which just looking back at the last like four years or so of my career, that's just almost become unthinkable. Um, and so it's just, I, I feel very appreciative to New York Times and to Krause um, and a lot of the other reporters that I worked with, like Chris Chavez at Sports Illustrated, um, for like giving me that space to share my story and, and hopefully help other people. Is this the most you've enjoyed running since you started? Yeah, I would definitely say so. Um, you know, the elementary school version of myself who just ran like a mile once a year and ate sloppy joes right beforehand and was just trying to run as fast as I could was maybe having the most fun if I'm being really real. Um, but, you know, I think these last few months has helped me reflect even on uh, my journey as an athlete in high school when I ran at a very competitive level. And I loved running then, but I think a lot of my drive also did come from like really wanting to win and really like almost loving it because I was good at it. And I, I you know, have spoken to many athletes where it's like injury cycles are I think when you almost unfortunately have an opportunity to differentiate really why you love it. And I think it made me realize that, yeah, I, I wanna win. Like I wanna be the best that I can, but that's not the only reason that I lace up every day to run. Um, and so it's just been like a, an opportunity to reframe my mindset. Your your story coming out in the in the New York Times last fall it seemed like it really um, was a catalyst in the kind of the fix girls sports movement. I, I, I want to know what progress, if any, you've seen in that and what are you still hoping to, and I know that it's been a short amount of time relative to big things changing, but progress in the sport, whether it be, you know, coaches knowing how to properly coach women's sports um, or, or maybe more representation on the, on the female level. What, what changes, if any, have you seen since your, your piece in the New York times? Yeah. So I, you know, I think I always kind of like to start up and saying, I didn't expect, um, that level of support after my piece came out. Um, I had expected it to stay very niche just within the running world. Um, I expected reactions to be 50, 50, like they almost had been throughout my career of either really positive or really negative. And, you know, that, that would be kind of that. Um, and so to have such a resounding level of support and, you know, of course there were some people who might've said otherwise, but to know that it made such an impact for people, um, was something that was really just powerful for me because it was very scary and very difficult for me to sit in front of a camera and um, share what my experience was. Um, and so to have this almost movement built up around it um, just, I, I think, helped me in my own healing process. It was like, rather than kind of having to carry this weight of trying to um, like come out of these experiences on my own, I could almost share it with other people. And it since made me um, really driven to try to continue not only to be a voice for change and to try to set an example of, um, you know, ways the sport can kind of move going forward, um, but to also just hopefully continue to develop connections and um, experiences in this sport where I can kind of develop a more sustainable model for um, athletes and coaches to look to. And I know one of the things that transpired after the piece was Nike said they were going to put together an investigation and ended up being an, an internal investigation of which you were, of course, critical. Um, what, if anything, have you heard from Nike other than that? Are you ever in communication with your former sponsor anymore? And, and do you feel satisfied with what you've heard on their end? Uh, like short answer, no, <laughs> long answer. Um, I was, uh, along with many athletes reached out to inform that that was going to be happening. Um, 
but in truth, I didn't feel safe participating um, because there were just certain individuals who were involved in certain messages that were sent um, where it became very clear, at least to me, that it wasn't being done, at least in my opinion, to make changes, but more to um, kind of just dig. And um, I, a few months later, um, Erin Strout from Women's Running messaged me and said that she just found out that the investigation had ended. And I was like, what do you mean? And she was like, oh yeah, like, turns out they finished two weeks ago and don't want to release any information publicly. But I think made a list of like six things that they wanted to change, which included hiring more women's coaches, um, investing money, and things kind of along that language. And I really hope they're doing that. Like I support, you know, the, the very generalized um, list of things that they wanted to do, but I'm also not really confident that like, it was such a vague list of things that you would almost have thought, weren't you already doing all of those things, um, that I'm not really confident that the investigation really was kind of anything other than just a kind of publicity thing. And, and that might sound cynical, and I hope I'm wrong, but, um, yeah, I just, I don't understand why it kind of was, like, never really addressed publicly, so... Mm -hmm. I mean, what would be the terms with which you would agree to participate? It sounds like you would want an independent inquiry into what's going on and not one that's done internally as, as the first step for you being on board and giving recommendations. Yeah. And I mean, I think there's always going to be questions of um, integrity in situations like this, because when, you know, and, and this is, you know, just a very broad statement for any company, um, when you're investigating yourself, you just have more, you know, interest in maybe not finding certain things. Um, but at the same time, in this case, it was that there were certain individuals who were, like, on the emails and seemingly leading the investigation who were, let's just say, very involved <laughs> in, you know, what would have been found. Um, mm -hmm. And so I know a lot of athletes just didn't, like, didn't feel safe talking to, you know, a bunch of lawyers. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think in these sort of situations, my attitude has always been that I want everybody to do the right thing. And I hope that this is something that everybody has kind of learned from and we can all, you know, going forward, uh, reflect upon, you know, best practices. Um, but I, I think there has to first be a truly honest reflection of your past um, in order to make a really positive change to go towards your future. Um, and I know for me, it's been when I've been in denial about what's happened, um, that there's no opportunity for growth. Because if you can't kind of address the bad with the good, there's no opportunity to look forward um, and really have kind of let go of whatever was weighing you down. How do you, you, you frame this obviously as a problem with, with the group or the, the company as a whole, but that company also sponsors the most high profile women's group in the in, entire country. What do you say? How do you respond when someone says, well, this is more of an Alberto Salazar, Nike Oregon project issue and not something that's company wide, that company wide they are taking the right steps and there is a healthy country, uh, uh, culture in certain parts of the, the company. Well, I know for sure um, any, you know, any company is not a person, you know, like right off the bat, mm -hmm. you, you know, you're, you're not an individual, you are a corporation. And just like any person has, you know, positives and, you know, negatives to their personality, a corporation is going to have good eggs and bad eggs. Um, and of course, after my story came out, um, a lot of people actually band together and um, had a walkout one day that was like very tamed and very shut down and pretty mm -hmm. much were told they weren't 
like allowed to do anything <laughs> but i really just it meant a lot to me the fact that um you know people like wanted to make change even within their own company and and from even like an internal perspective could see some of the uh you know kind of systemic issues that i was speaking to and so i think you know as i've always kind of said with anything it's um you know like a company is a collection of people and it's about really trying to create a culture where everybody feels safe obviously your your young career was very very successful in 2013 and in 2014 being that you made a world final at such a young age and then winning that world junior title being that you were associated with the nike organ project and i know you didn't officially join until maybe uh i forget exactly when it was you can remind me but i'm wondering now those career high points um how do you view them now given what came after it uh, in the years in 2015, and then ultimately with your, you know, 2019, your your criticism of of the team in Alberta. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you can always, you know, in so many ways, it's like you can get caught looking back at things and just be as negative as you want or as positive as you want. And I think for me, it's like all those moments are past now. Um, and I look back at the running accomplishments that I achieved is really inspiring. I think um you know the way that i balance my academic load and my family life and um being an elite runner um you know inspires me kind of going forward even with tracksmith where i'm like i know i can balance things and i know i thrive having um you know these kind of like external to my running career lives um and so i am like from a from an athletic standpoint, I'm really positive. And I think from a personal perspective, it, you know, it kind of makes me reflect on things that I did really well during that time and also things that I didn't. Like I think I was really lucky to be very, you know, successful and running really well. But I think the version of me of 2013 maybe wouldn't have handled certain hardships as well. Um, as I would now, and my resiliency over certain areas has probably improved. Um, so I think you're one thing that I've kind of learned as I've gotten older, and I'm sure many people can understand when I say this, is that looking back at your past is a very um, slippery slope in that, you know, you should be able to learn from the negatives, you should be able to celebrate the positives, but you can't live back there. Um, you can't live in the future either. The only time you can really be is the present. Um, and so you should really be only looking back or looking forward as motivation and opportunities for growth and learning uh, rather than, you know, as a place to be sucking your kind of life away with. Mm -hmm. And a little closer to the present, you ran this past indoor season, and it seemed from the outside that you had a breakthrough when you ended the season with the, the 907 after being in the 920s for 3K previously. Uh, how was that for you? How was that performance for you? What did you take that as? Was that a big step forward? And I know we're all at this pause button right now, but what what's the future of your your career on the, on the track? And do you think you can still be competitive uh, like you had been previously? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was so excited that day in Boston because one, it was just a really fun meet. I got to make a lot of new friends, see a lot of friends. Um, as everybody knows that Boston circuit's really fun because it's kind of just like a low key um, environment in terms of just the, you know, you can kind of hang out in the infield and everybody can hang out at the track. Um, and yet there's just so many incredibly elite athletes who come together for those meets um so it was just like fun to be back in that environment but i think from a like performance perspective i i knew that that was like that that should come um i when i started my like kind of healthy running kick again it was october of 2019 um and so when i was racing in january you know i knew it was going to be a bit of a rough ride just from the fact that I, I really didn't have that much training under my belt and the years prior had been so 
just sporadic, um, that it was a real challenge for me to almost practice racing with a lot of humility because I knew I probably wasn't going to be really in the top of the field. And I remember the Dr. Sanders meet, I was like, um, I haven't run this fast for one mile and that's what we're going out in. Like, let's just see what happens. <laughs> um, and so I knew that my training was continuing to progress and, you know, as many people know, sometimes it's just a matter of time for things to start clicking. Um, and although it was definitely frustrating to not to be racing when I wasn't really at full speed and knew I wasn't at full speed, um, it was really rewarding to be able to kind of end the season on a bit of a high and also to, you know, understand that had I not kind of gone through those 924 races, then it probably would have been hard for me, even had I done all the workouts, um, to immediately hop on the track and run like I did. Um, and for me, I just know that my runway to that point was, um, left with many untapped <laughs> training opportunities. Um, I was really excited this past build up cause I broke 30 seconds for the 200 for the first time in like three years or something. And my boyfriend got to witness it. My mom was there. Um, so it was kind of fun just to be able to have that moment and be like, Oh wow, there's, there's a lot of runway left here. Um, and so looking at, you know, this next year, I don't really have racing expectations because I, I'm, I just don't really assume that there's going to be racing opportunities. So I'm looking at 2020 as an opportunity to just finally have that opportunity to really string months of healthy running together um, and look more towards 2021 and, you know, race if I can this fall if there's opportunities, but not necessarily like derive a schedule around racing. When you step on the start line now, do you say, I'm still I'm still the same person as the one that ran 159 and 404 because a lot of runners get affirmation from their past performances if they go through setbacks but other runners maybe want to keep it more present focused and not have to chase the expectations of, of what they've done in the, in the past how do you how's your mindset before you take the line um I think it's a little bit of both and that I, I you know, I really do believe that I have the ability to get back to those racing levels. And whether or not I literally do, um, I think the opportunity to just be able to even chase it is exciting. But honestly, like, even some of my PRs, like, my 5K PR is only 15.45. Like, that's not maybe even as fast as I would have been physically capable of running um, at different points in my career and my 3K is an 858. Um, and so it's kind of fun to be able to look at those and be like, hey, like there's some there's some low hanging fruit. <laughs> Let's go for those first and then see, keep working my way back down to that 800. Um, but I, I think it's really important for athletes. And this is true whether you're just ending, like building up and starting uh, a new season or whether you're coming out of injury or had a really long layoff like myself um, to really try and work outs in particular to not compare yourself. I think when you're in a race, you're not really, um, you don't almost have the time to think as much, but when mm. you're in uh, workouts, you know, I, I've run a 25, five, 200. So breaking 30 used to be something that I could, you know, during certain parts of my career do for breakfast. But right now I'm like, thrilled <laughs> that I was able to do it a couple times this past season. And it's about just, you know, finding new goals and new ways to improve. And there are certain aspects of my training now that, I mean, even at my most peak form, the long runs I do now, I think would have really scared me. <laughs> but, you know, just you change as you get older and it's about just keep trying to improve your weaknesses and um, strengthen your strengths and you know, compare when it's healthy and to forget about it when it's not. Going back a little bit to the earlier part of your career, I know in the New York Times piece, I think, or it might have been the, the piece with, with Chavez, you talked about 2015 and then there was that incident at the Oxy meet. Um, that always stuck out to me because um, 
you were still really good in 2015. You're still really good in 2016. Those would have been your, what, your freshman year of college and your sophomore year of college. And you were making U.S. finals. I think right now, if a freshman made a U.S. final straight out of the NCAA, we'd say that's a huge accomplishment. But because what you did uh, before, it, it didn't seem as, as, as big. I, and it just struck me as really strange that there would be so much criticism from a coaching perspective on a, on a performance when you were still so good. Is that just the culture of if you're not making teams, then – you're not important. What what is that? Because a lot of these things, it just they seem so de- detrimental to your development. They didn't even seem like good coaching, and and that was confusing to me. Yeah, and I, I think in retrospect, it's confusing to me too. Because I mean, I remember I came in eighth at USA's in 2015, and I mean, the 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 backlash was incredible, and it felt like the you know world had ended. And now I sit here and I'm like, whoa, like, it is pretty good. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, it's all about how you, how you frame something. And, you know, I think even now, sometimes I look back at my career and I'm like, you know, I was a pro from 2013 to 2014 and, you know, I was still 11th in 2016. Um, but I think the culture was one in which, um, like anything other than team making was a fail. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, like, I don't really fully understand why, um, like, why that was the case, or, you know, in, in certain ways, for some people, there wasn't really that level of pressure, but for others, there was. Um, but, yeah, I mean, for me now, I just, you know, I I kind of look back at 2015 and 2016, actually, with, and I feel in certain ways they give me more confidence than even previous years, because I'm like, wow, I was in a really, really bad place. I still did pretty well. <laughs> like the amount of like emotional just damage I was incurring during that time and the fact that I just hated every step of running and could still like I think I still squeaked out like four oh nine my freshman year or something. Um, it just kind of reminds me that it's like even when things aren't going perfectly, if you just keep showing up, um, I think I still have a really large runway to, you know, kind of build back up to that. But yeah, I, you know, I think for any um, coach or for any uh, runner who's, you know, whether you're middle school, high school, college, it doesn't matter. um, If you're feeling this, like, just immeasurable pressure always to win or medal um you you should take a step back and maybe just figure out exactly where that pressure is coming from and why that's the case because you know i'm an incredibly competitive person i always have been um the other day my boyfriend did more pull-ups than i did and i was very upset about it like so i'm not i'm not gonna be <laughs> not competitive but when it's the end of the world to have other hardworking, incredibly talented people beat you, um, that's that's a problematic mindset to be um, like pushed onto you. And when, when you were around and when you were training with the group, did you was was it successful with other people? We obviously see the successes of not just their group but other groups from this win at all cost mentality. Yeah. But you could also just say they're winning and running really fast because they're insanely talented people and they're training hard and the extra pressure isn't making them better it just happens to be a thing that goes along with it is this is this something that that uh, works for some people and then it's just being prescribed onto everybody or would everybody benefit by a, a more holistic approach to to coaching even with professional runners running for large amounts of money i think looking at a lot of the people um who have success in these programs I always am more like, oh my gosh, if they weren't getting hurt as much or if it was designed a little bit more for them and there was more encouragement, I'm like, they, they'd probably be unstoppable because there is such talent, there is such a hardworking effort um, in all these athletes. And I think, you know, you'll always have um, those kind of like more rare elite level athletes who maybe aren't like as competitively driven, like it's more like an external push and maybe they really do need it. But 
I do feel the majority of um, like elite athletes have such a strong internal drive that if anything, they would do better having a coach who holds them back the day that they're really sore and probably mm -hmm. don't need that extra 20 minute run, but might tweak something if they go out there. Um, and so, yeah, I, I agree with what you said. I, I think it's, if you only have one culture and some people run well, then it's going to look like, oh, it works. But if you actually have the opportunity to be on many different teams and you look at a lot of individuals who are on very healthy programs, very, um, like positive, you know, uh, like in very just healthy spaces, they're doing just as well, if not better than, um, mm -hmm. some individuals who are kind of, I think, trapped a little bit more in these when at all cost scenarios. I'm curious what, how you think, and this is a broad question, so it's not just specifically for you to answer, but how you think the pandemic will affect the, the professional running economy? You kind of mentioned, I think in an outside article, like the pressure per performing to maintain a contract. And I'm wondering if you think that will be sort of intensified given the, the, the maybe the economical restraints on shoe companies we've seen. Mm -hmm. And I, the, the example I would bring up is no NCAA athletes have signed a shoe sponsor deal um, since the sport kind of halted. And I, I'm wondering, give, given your experience with Nike and then now joining doing this uh, unique Tracksmith deal, what you think we'll see out of the professional running economy? Yeah, I think it is... <sighs> I mean, it's just, it's tough on everybody right now. Um, I, I think like many of the shoe companies had paused on signing NCAA athletes, partly because they were trying to figure out what to do. And, and I don't know this for a fact, this is just my conjecture, um, with athletes who maybe had contracts up at the end of the year. Um, you know, traditionally contracts are structured around the Olympic cycle. And now that that's been pushed back, there might just be like more of a need to brainstorm, like how, like, are we going to support everybody through the next year? Is, is, are some people going to have to be cut? Like, I, I think it's just, a, um, like the Olympic year alone being adjusted, I think is probably creating some just logistical issues for companies. And, you know, of course, budgets might get a little bit tighter. Um, I think we're experiencing a minor running boom right now. And I don't know how much that's um, like helping these shoe companies economically, but I, I feel of the industries that are hit, I, I don't, I like, I kind of wonder if running apparel lines are maybe being protected a little bit because of new people running um and so i don't think we're gonna see like a really dramatic like 50 percent of athletes don't have a contract next year um but you know i think for maybe smaller companies or companies that are um maybe even not a primary sponsor to athletes who are trying to figure out how they can not only uh, continue like helping athletes and supporting them, but maybe are getting into like slightly stricter budget, um, you know, restrictions. I think it would be just an interesting thing to throw out to them that the opportunity for athletes to be more involved is out there. Um, and whether it's a full-time employee relationship or even a part-time opportunity, that could be a way for companies and athletes to mutually get more out of each other. Um, because if you're hiring your athlete to be a customer service representative, um, you know, that's a really high touch opportunity for them to be, you know, talking to your customer base and interacting with people. But it's also maybe then, um, you know, one less job that you have to outsource to somebody else. Um, so I think this is, you know, maybe a time for companies to be creative and to be inspired by people who are doing things differently. Um, as most people know, New York City was a, unfortunately a hotspot for the pandemic. I'm wondering how, what it, what is training running outside been like for you in these last couple of months? Yeah, so I 
um, was very lucky in that I had the opportunity uh, to leave the city. Um, I left with my boyfriend a couple months ago. We're, we're out in Long Island right now. Um, uh, because honestly, I was, like at the time, unsure if the Olympics were still going to happen. Um, the, the trials weren't immediately delayed. There was no, um, like there was just no clear path yet. And so I was really nervous at what was going to happen in terms of training. And we intend to go back to the city actually, um, this weekend, um, you know, and kind of see how things are. I know, um, you know, dog parks have been closed, but public parks haven't been closed. And there's been some, um, talk that like certain times a day, it's just, really difficult to get out and run because there are so many people out. But if you go at like 7 a.m., 7 p.m., you should be okay. Uh, I, I think it's just a really difficult, um, you know, kind of pressure to juggle where you're, you're still trying to get your training in while also just respecting uh, the rules right now and understanding that, you know, you have to social distance as best you can. And that's why I do feel very lucky that we were able to come out here because would have been really like just harder to do the level of training that I needed um, within our one bedroom apartment. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot <laughs> of, it's uh, a lot of laps. That's a lot of laps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For those, for yeah. those people who are listening, for those people who are listening and not watching, Mary has won the Flowtrack podcast best background competition of all of our guests the last <laughs> couple months. Uh, it is a picturesque day. It looks like in, in Long Island. Uh, I'm wondering, Mary, did you see the did you see the news? The high schooler Bryn Brown did a 9:39, 3200-meter time trial yesterday. No, that's great. That's great. Yeah. So what what did and obviously she's going to get well. She's already been tagged. You know that phenom label. What advice um, do you give people who have all this pressure on them at such an early age? Because there's there's not many who have done what you've done. What advice would you give them? Yeah, I mean, I think first off, um, I'd like to always remind kids that life is not just like an upward pointing arrow um, and that it's okay to have a bad day. If you have a bad race and you were projected to win it and, you know, blow away some record and you end up finishing in fifth place, that's okay. If you need somebody to reach out to, reach out to me. I've been there. Um, but you know, I think one way for kids to be able to almost like not only know that it's okay to sometimes rough path, um, but to be supported through those times is just to surround yourself with coaches, friends, um, you know, your even if your family's like super into running, just, you know, set, set kind of boundaries and standards for, you know, like maybe at the dinner table, you don't talk about running. Um, I know for my parents, they, they really don't know anything about running and that was never an issue. Um, but that is sometimes a, like a story I'll kind of hear where it's just, you know, the, the pressure can sometimes feel external. Um, and that's why I just like, especially if you're in the high school circuit, I encourage kids to, you know, be a part of other clubs and maybe just running, um, have mm -hmm. friends who, you know, you had a rough running day, you can go to them and be like, you play soccer, you have no idea what I'm talking about. And you don't care that I ran 10 seconds slower today. Um, and then I think as they're just continuing on their path and, uh, you know, whether that's being recruited by a college program or um, whatever it may be, just to always be very cognizant of the people and the cultures you're going to surround yourself with. Um, if you go on a recruiting visit and, you know, you notice things that kind of set off red flags, whether it's the fact that, um, you know, you feel the support staff only answers to the coach and not really to the athletes. It's something to be aware of. Um, if, you know, 60% of the girls on the team are currently injured, um, you know, that's something to kind of be aware of. You know, try to find the programs where it just feels like a community, the coaches, you know, and the support staff are really looking out not only for the team, but also for the individual in their own development. Um, and, you know, find a group that you feel you can not only fit in, but also make friends in your classes who maybe don't run. 
Um, and it's not that I'm <laughs> trying to encourage people not to have runner friends, but <laughs> I think one thing that's been very- They're like, lame, let's be very, honest. <laughs> the worst, no. Uh, I think what's been very helpful for me is that when I was in high school, I came from a K through 12 school. So the kids who I was friends with my, you know, sophomore, junior, senior year, when I was running very well, I mean, like, none of them ran. I, like, two of them were on the boys' team, but, like, we were not, we were not the popular crew. Um, let's put it that way. And they're still, you know, some of my closest friends today. And in college, um, because I didn't go to school um, to compete for an NCAA program, none of, like, none of my friends from school run. And I think that's been really important for me, not just as a de my development as an athlete, but also as a person to um, kind of know that there's life outside of running. Mm -hmm. Talking to you now, it's, it's interesting because I was at the 2013 US Champs when you won your first US title. I think that was the one that was won in like 505 or something in the mile. It was like crazy tactical. Yeah. Uh, and I think you were the youngest person since Allison Felix. So you broke Allison Felix's record. And and people had been interviewing you before that, obviously. And everybody used the same descriptors of she's bubbly and the mic, you know, she's uh, off the cuff. She's so herself and authentic. And, and I remember being struck by that in person. And then talking to you now, seven years later, you have some of those exact same traits but you had this whole you had this whole life in between did did that ever did that ever waver did that ever get because i remember when the news came out i remember thinking man that's insane that she went all through that because i remember watching all these interviews and doing some of these interviews and being in those mix zones and hearing her talk and it just it, it didn't comport with with what you know our our outside vision of what was going on in your life yeah no and i think that's actually a really interesting question and something that like I think in my own ways I've kind of reflected upon where um you know I remember growing up I used to watch like interviews of older runners maybe in middle school and I used to be like oh some of these kids are so boring because they would just be like oh yeah like I ran two miles and like trained or you know something like that okay. and I was like what are you doing like have some fun with quoting Harry <laughs> like, Potter on... yeah. oh mm -hmm. yeah I remember I talked about milkshakes one time for like a whole interview and, you know, I brought Puddles the Duck to all the interviews to yeah, like, yeah. be another person to talk to and talk through. Um, and I don't know, I just, I found it really fun to talk about running. And so I wanted to keep it fun. Um, but I think the only way to do that is just to be very honest. And one thing I think for me is that like my, um, my attitude has always been, especially like in front of the camera, that just just tell the truth like just say how you're feeling and if that's really excited and you're bouncing off the walls then say that um if it's a serious topic be that way and i think the only time i really wavered in that was probably during the periods of time when there was no cameras wanting to talk to me and i think had there been like had there been somebody trying to interview me in like 2018 let's say I think I would have been like a very scared looking person on the other end um, because I feel if you if you feel you can't like say the truth and speak your truth and and just kind of almost talk off the cusp and be unscripted and you know be yourself um, I think then it would be very hard have been very hard for me to kind of like let that personality come out um, and so I have sometimes thought about that where I'm like, you know, that's kind of sad and scary. And I hope, you know, other runners, whether, you know, who watch this don't feel that they need to put on some sort of show or act like everything's perfect because like, that's just not life. That's just not running. Um, and it's, it's okay to like, tell your truth. Sorry, the awkward pause there. I, th I was waiting on Kevin, and then I thought he was. I thought he was frozen. Lincoln there. was well, contemplating. Thing, you looked ready to go. Yeah, you looked ready deep, to roll deep there, in Lincoln. thought. Yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> One thing I did want to ask was: we you mentioned that life isn't necessarily this arrow pointing up, and when we look at your story from the New York Times article, 
um, for what you shared there. And, and you mentioned the, the bout of cutting yourself that you went through. We kind of look at that as the low and then everything maybe has been pointing up since then. I'm wondering if you view it as that was your low and now you're just always steadily on this path to healing. Are there mountains and peaks and valleys along the way? We all deal with mental health things. It's not just a thing limited to people that have been quote unquote diagnosed with something or or have you know practiced unfortunately self-harm. But is that something that you you are constantly like trying to you're having to to still deal with even though you're you're out of that period of your life that may have really caused that or what what what's going on in in, in that portion of your life yeah i think this is something that's really important to talk about um because i think the only thing um kind of since november and me sharing my story that at times have, has almost made me feel kind of bad or you know i've almost really wanted to clear up is it's not just up and down and you know it's not like i ran really well i had a bad year and now i'm great again um mm -hmm. there's there's been a lot of healing between that and there will probably have to be a lot of healing going forward um you know i think many of these you know behaviors can become really ingrained in a person and, and it's not that i'm doing that anymore i haven't um for some time but it's not like I did it once and it's not like I did it at one meet and then it was over. Um, and that's scary to admit, but I think, you know, it's, it's like with um, disordered eating habits where it's once they become ingrained, um, it's hard to fully shake that. It's going to take a lot of time. And I don't know, is even that going to be something where I'm, ever fully out of that like woods figuratively um and it's not to say i can't be really healthy and and still doing all of the right things but i think it's really hard once you've experienced something to not at times slip into those mindsets and um you know sometimes for me it's just learning like what my triggers are almost um and although i'm like in a very good place now. I'm also trying not to be too hard on myself to now feel like I need to maintain almost a level of perfection. Um, and so even though there's certain like behaviors I, I really hope to never engage in again, um, like in order to do that, I have to be compassionate to myself and realize that it's, you know, there are gonna be ups, there's gonna be downs. And I hope everybody knows that because I think sometimes when you um, almost share your story in such a public way, there can be this misconception that that means like you share it once you're fully healed. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's something that can ever, um, you know, like fully be the case because I think for anybody in order to share something, you're probably going to be on your healing journey still. Got it. Is I, I hate to be I hate to use this cliche term of closure, but is that is that possible in this in this case? I don't think so, and it's not. And I don't say that necessarily in a in a bad way, but I think our um, you know the way society kind of depicts that maybe in a movie, for example, mm -hmm. you know, there's a big hug at the end, and we all walk you know, in our own directions, but with a smile on our face. And I just, I don't think that's realistic. I don't, um, I think uh, my younger self really, really thought that that was what I needed and that was what I had to get um, in order to kind of move on with my life in a sad way. Um, and I don't feel that anymore because I think that idea is giving other people power over how the rest of your life can be written um mm -hmm. and to me that doesn't mean that i like hold any ill will or a negative or you know like anything like that but 
um, I, I think it's something where I just realized that, like, in order to heal, in order to move on, in order to proceed, those are choices you have to make. Um, and I'm, you know, really lucky and grateful to have people who can help push me in that direction on the days that I don't want to move there <laughs> and mm -hmm. that I've in general um, been kind of going, you know, on that path myself. So. I assume you haven't talked at all to the coaching staff. No. No. Can you, you talked before about how you're enjoying running at least for the longest you've enjoyed running since your sloppy Joe run one mile in middle school <laughs> era of running. Um, what about watching track? What about turning? I know it's not on right now, but the, like the 2019 world championships, <laughs> are you, are you, are you tuning in? Are you able to enjoy that? So I would say there was a period of time, maybe in 2017, where I didn't follow the sport at all. Um, mm -hmm. any, any aspect to it. Um, I just was very much like knee deep in my own, um, like eating disorder recovery, um, and trying to like still figure out if I was going to run and just a lot of different things. And then in 2018 was when I met my boyfriend, Jake, um, and I met him through my running coach, John Henwood, who coaches a team of sub elite runners. And most of them are like 230 to 250 um, marathon racers. And that just opened up a whole new world for me because I realized you could be a really like big fan of the sport and it didn't have to all be track. Um, it didn't have to be kind of watching the races that maybe I wasn't almost ready to watch um, because there was still like a little bit of sadness that I was hurt and not there and that sort of stuff. Um, and so I got really into not only just like the New York City local running scene, um, but also just maybe a little bit more the road racing circuit. And I got really into just like, you know, cheering on my friends who were, you know, running and racing to better themselves rather than to like win a race um and that's been something that's been like a really incredible experience when um you know straight pro and many people really know that there's this like, whole other world out there mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. people who run <laughs> like that's why we have fans because other people run um, right, yeah. and it's been, you know, it's been kind of like maybe a little new and a little different how I'm following it. Um, and I still now follow my friends on the circuit and other stuff, but I would almost say I'm, I'm more of a fan of the sport as a whole than, um, exclusively following the professional circuit. What did you get your degree in, in college? Um, I got my degree in business administration with a concentration right. in marketing and like a secondary concentration in sports. Um, and then I did all my pre-med requirements. So you're using it. You're like the only 24 year old who's like using <laughs> what they learned in college for a degree. Con mm -hmm. Congrats on that. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. No. And I, you know, I was initially a chem major because um, I'd always, you know, kind of thought that like maybe I'd go down a medical route. Um, and mm -hmm. I reached a certain point in my um like after my freshman year of college i just was like you know i really love running and even if i want to go down a medical route all i need are my pre-med requirements so i did all of those and then i was like i want to get a degree in something that i'm actually like gonna use and like plan to use mm -hmm. and want to use um and so it worked out really well <laughs> yeah it's it's funny how that stuff kind of does work out sometimes like a lot of times it doesn't but when it does it, it's it's awesome yeah yeah and I, and I always wanted to be able to have a you know usable degree in something that i was interested in and i went to fordham um for my undergrad and it was it was a really great experience for me well mary thank you so much for your time best of luck on the new job say hello to the dog for us um, I could, I can think I'd hear them in the background there. In addition to the birds too, we, we never get birds in this podcast. So 
Yeah, a picturesque <laughs> scene there in, in Long Island. Uh, thank you so much. Best of luck going forward. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Thanks.